So, welcome, Excellencies, to this panel, and uh, thank you again for joining us today for this uh, important discussion. We're very honored to have you here with us uh, for the launch of the report, but more importantly, to hear about um, national perspectives on this topic. The overview that I've just been, uh, that I've just given has been very global, um, and we'd like to now zoom in onto some country situations and hear the experiences of your countries in dealing with this uh, issue. So I know that, uh, Ambassador Dalil, you need to, well, we've still got a bit of time, but you need to leave us a little bit early, so I'd like to give you the floor first to hear about the situation in Afghanistan. Thank you. Placement and generating these discussions once in a year, this time of the year, and bringing us all together on internal displacement. I remember I attended the similar session last year, last year in May, and, and probably this is the only um, time in the year where we discuss with a lot of great, great details the IDPs. So I thank you for, for convening this meeting and bringing us together on this one. I would like to speak on causes of, of uh, displacement in my country and at the linkages with other uh, movement and this uh, population movement. And I will also speak about what government does in terms of government leadership to address the situation. Afghanistan in last year, according to the report, has got a few, uh, few hundred thousand IDPs, internally displaced person, and uh, in total we have 1.2 million internally displaced um, at the beginning of the year. Large of this, most of this uh, IDPs are from conflict, from uh, security, and um, another portion of this IDPs are from natural disasters, including flood, earthquakes, and droughts. Um, security has been a driving factor for displacement and also for generating refugees um, from the country, for, especially for the last couple of years. And this is because Afghanistan took the responsibility for security, for providing security from January 2015. So the full responsibility has been taken by, by, by government, and that um, came along with um, intensified uh, insurgencies and attacks, including suicide attacks uh, and conflict. You have documented in the report that around 560,000 people are returned last year, which is a little bit less than the number that was returned the previous year. So the year before, we have got around 600,000 people returned, largely from Pakistan and Iran, and last year, around 560,000 people returned. And this is in addition to 1.2 million IDPs that the country has. What we have seen in Afghanistan is a cycle of vulnerability and poverty that, that is very much intertwined between internal displacement and then returnees. And some of those returnees, if they are not uh, successfully integrated into the communities, they become IDPs. And then after some time, they intend to also cro cross the border and leave the country. So there is a very close relationship between internal displacement, between uh, crossing the border and becoming refugees, and some of them even come far, very, very to, to far countries, and also return if it's premature, if it's not um, uh, done in a dignified and sustainable way, there's also a risk that those who have returned, they become internally displaced. Data from, from your report shows that, and, and I would like to quote the data from, from your report that was released last year, and, and uh, it suggests that the pull, the pull and the push factors for internal displacement are the same or similar to those reported by refugees. According to your report, more than half of Afghans who entered Europe via Greece in the first three months of 2016 said that they had initially be, been displaced internally, and another quarter were, for, were first or second generation of refugees who had never lived in Afghanistan. So we, we see that evidently and statistically there is, um, uh, uh, they are very much interconnected. I would like to now speak about what we have done, what the government of Afghanistan has done. We have a policy for internally displaced people, and that policy is from 2003. So we have a national po policy 
uh, on internally displaced person that was endorsed on 2013, and that is, um, that is in force. For example, the IDP policy states that no displaced children should be denied an education if even if they cannot afford uh, essentials like school books, uniforms, and other educational supplies, government is responsible to cover the educational services. That's, that's only one example. Given the influx of returnees and the uh, IDPs, since 2015, the government established a Displacement and Returns Executive Committee, which is at the higher government level and is chaired um, by, uh, by um, a chief executive, and in that, that's attended by ministers, by the United Nations, by some donor agencies, um, where they look into the um, humanitarian assistance, uh, documentation, access to basic services, uh, land reforms, uh, and adequate housing and shelter. So what we have been doing in Afghanistan is, with all what's going on in the country, we are trying to make very difficult decisions on allocating resources to address the needs of IDPs as well as the returnees. The land reform is one of the uh, important items in the agenda for the government, and that includes for those who return to the country who are registered and, and uh, for their successful integration and also uh, some, some of the IDPs. What, is, what we, we have been trying to do from beginning of this year is, is also to focus a lot at the implementation level and at the local governance level. Our Ministry of Refugees and Repatriation has uh, directorates or structures in every 34 province, and they have been provided assistance and support to take those national decisions into the local implementation and make sure that those communities are, uh, their needs are met. What we need at the global level. Let me um, share with you very frankly that we need more political commitment and financial resources to be invested in conflict prevention and state building, including building of security systems and governance systems in diplomacy, in peace building, and disaster risk management. And this is a call that, that address all of us and all of the international community. We also need, this is relevant to Geneva, uh, what I said. Number two, we also need to look, especially in chronic conflict, in chronic displacement, where you have returnees, IDPs, and refugees, and, 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 and um, a cycle of vulnerability and poverty. We do not need to look at this from a humanitarian perspective. We need to linkage that with the development. Our structures in the multilateral system is structures that do not probably welcome this idea, but we have to look at those structures and the way we do the business, and we bring this humanitarian and development much closer uh, because that will make a huge difference in, in the countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dalila. I think you've already covered uh, quite a number of uh, very relevant topics. Um, the issue of returns, I think, is key, not just in Afghanistan, but uh, will probably be relevant in, in a number of other countries. How do we ensure that IDP returns happen in a sustainable way, but that refugee returns also don't lead to uh, more internal displacement? Um, I think you've also touched on uh, really the crux of the issue here is how do we build uh, systems that allow us to respond both to the immediate humanitarian impacts of the issue but also to the longer term development uh, challenges associated to it. So we'll come back to that in the, in the discussion but thank you very much for, for this uh, perspective. Um, I will travel around the world um, all the way to Ethiopia and uh, ask Ambassador Botora to 
give us a perspective on uh, displacement in, in your country, particularly as um, your, your colleague, Commissioner Kassa, the head of the Disaster Risk Management uh, Authority in Addis, who was uh, supposed to be with us here today, was not able to make it, precisely because he has been asked to, uh, to respond urgently to the flash floods that have been affected, affecting parts of Ethiopia. So we're very pleased that you could join us here today to, to, to give a national perspective. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first of all thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I would like also to take this opportunity to thank IDMC for this uh, launch of the global report on IDPs. Uh, we have been using actually this uh, report for our own purpose in Ethiopia. So we'd like to encourage you to continue to come up every year with this important statistics on, uh, on IDPs. As we have said, my state minister was very much willing to come. Unfortunately, due to unfortunate circumstances, he couldn't make it. And uh, so I'm happy to be with you uh, the, this, this afternoon. Um, let, let me say first, uh, in general, before I say about Ethiopian experience, um, from my own personal experience, since I have been involved in this issue for many, many years, starting from here in Geneva, I think we have to recognize one fact. The IDP phenomena, we have to live together with this phenomena. We have to learn how to live with it because it's a continuous problem. It will continue to be with us. Therefore, our shifting of the attitudes and the mindset, the philosophy, the innovation that we are going to approach this problem has to be in accordance with this kind of thinking. And secondly, I don't know how much, when you compare this humanitarian issue with other important issues like refugees and migration, how much visibility it has got globally. That's a major issue. I haven't seen so far, I may be wrong, there is no an international day of internal displaced persons, for instance. In the refugee case and migration, you see it. So I think the work that we have done when it comes to creation of awareness of the importance of the IDPs is, is important. You can see it now, even when the international community is working towards an important compact, two compacts on refugees and migration. IDP is no longer there. Why? We have to ask this question. And uh, the fact that humanitarian issues are being getting now a, a bit more visible, but I think this is the time also for the IDPs to think about. I understand that um, there has been a lot of effort and work um, done in this area, starting from Francis Deng. And, uh, when I was very young, I know him. And I really appreciate his works, and that's why he finally led us to these international guiding principles, which still helps us to, for advocacy as well as also for giving us a framework of monitoring what's going on when it comes to IDPs. So I think, um, um, having said this, uh, probably I will, I, will, I will share Ethiopian view or the experience of how we are dealing with this problem. And by the way, this phenomena, it has been with us for many years in Ethiopia. So that has given us also a special advantage in terms of how we have to deal with it. Since we have been together with this problem throughout the country, and so that forced us to, as I said, change our views, our approach in addressing the needs of these IDPs and the risk that associated with the disaster which are the driver cause of the driver cause of this uh, problem, and for that we we, we approached a new uh, way of working system. Uh, we used to do in the past to focus mainly on humanitarian issues and on the relief assistance. And um, I remember many years ago when we tried to get some sort of international assistance we stick to the fact that we don't want to see whatever resources are located to development shouldn't go to humanitarian assistance because we believe that development ultimately is the solution to this problem. 
So we don't want to see. But now this idea is changed. I'm happy to see in our own experience that there should be a nexus, there should be a linkage between humanitarian assistance and development endeavors. I'm happy that we see this in all major international frameworks, be it with the SDGs uh, 2030 uh, development agenda, the Sendai framework agreement, the climate change, Paris climate change, and others. So I think this is the time we have to shift. That's why Ethiopia is also making this shift, a shift in approach, a shift in attitude, a shift in, think, in, in, in practical implementation of uh, whatever policies we have. Let me say that we have three core principles that guide uh, and also that underlines the strategy, the policy, the action that we follow in regard to this problem. The first one is we believe that there should be the principle of ownership. Governments should be in the primary place, in the driver's seat, as we say, because it is a primary responsibility of governments. As they have the primary responsibility to protect IDPs, unfortunately, they are also the primary cause for the displacement. Therefore, government have to be very, very uh, uh, ready to take the responsibility, the process of uh, uh, this, uh, the whole issue of IDPs. Um, the second one is, I think, again, related to government. There should be a strong leadership when it comes to really implementing whatever foreign policy, whatever policy we have, whatever strategies we have. For this, government should be able to be willing politically and also their political commitment and their commitment in general is, is very important. Why? Because government has to be in this area in a very forceful way. As I said, governments have so many organs, so many branches of offices, sectorials. Therefore, they have to be what, you, what we call in the UN system now, as you know, the whole of government approach should be there. That's very important. So the government leadership is, is, is very important. And the other equally important principle is the principle of partnership. Partnership should be there always. No one is a single country be independent and free uh, of doing itself whatever it wants to do because of many, many factors that force us to work together in, in collaboration. When I say partnership, it should start from the local partnership. Government cannot do it alone by itself. There should be a private sector. There should be civil societies, NGOs. They have faith-based institutions. They have to include. They have to be there also uh, in, this, in this work. And of course, international, international partners are very important, be it donor communities, uh, countries, be it international. These are the core important guiding principles when it comes to addressing these problems. The principle of ownership, the principle of leadership, and the principle of you know, partnership. Now, what is our policy when it comes to disaster risk reduction or whatever uh, we call it a disaster response plan? Um, we have two basic approach. The first one is how we can address this problem in the short term. In the short term, uh, what we are trying to do in Ethiopia is uh, wherever this displ internal displacement is occurring, what we do is first we give them the chance to return to their origin area or place. That's very important because these people, you know, definitely they will feel more attached to their own origin, to their own areas because of culture, because of uh, intimacy, because of so many other things. So. There is one effective way of uh, using is to give them the chance of return. And the second, I think we have, to, we have to give them the chance, if they go to another area, to be integrated in that local community. If the local communities agree, then if these people as well, the internal displaced coming from other regions are willing to stay there, you should be given this opportunity. If they are not willing to do the return as well as this uh, integration, then it should be given the opportunity to resettle somewhere, another place, relocation. That's also important. We call it in our own context, vill villagization, which means we bring them together in some other areas where things are better, better for them. So this is a short-term perspective. What about the long-term perspective? The long-term perspective is finally informed, as I said before, 
with our new way of thinking. We try to link the development in humanitarian. Now, there are three things here when we look about uh, implementing this long-term uh, disaster risk policy. And the first one is we see the prevention and mitigation. That's very important. Before we are going to face the real problem of IDPs, we have to make sure that we have enough preventable tools that will help us and also mitigate whatever problem that we are facing. This is the first thing. And the second one, we have to prepare ourselves. Preparation and response. We have to prepare. Preparation, it's preparation by itself is very important. Unless you prepare, you can't be effective in terms of responding to the needs of the IDPs. Therefore, this is the second uh, point, or the second uh, aspect. And the third one is we have to strengthen our national system and also work towards recovery. This is, again, another important aspect. So the combination of all these three definitely will help us to address the problem based, as I said, on humanitarian disaster response plan that we have in the, in, in the country. The third one is a follow-up and, well, and, and um, implementation mechanism. We have in Ethiopia, as I said before, we give the importance of ownership now, the deputy prime minister is the one who is on the top of following everything. It doesn't mean the prime minister himself is not involved, but with the focal person at the highest level, the, the, prime minister, the deputy prime minister is responsible, and then we have a national commission to deal with this risk management, and then we have all this structure at the federal level, at the regional level, so that we will have coordination and uh, coherence in what, we are, in what we are doing. So definitely, at the end, we'll look into, we have our own targets and indicators, what makes, what, are, what have, uh, we have been able to achieve and make progress. That is, um, is, is also important for us. Finally, uh, what, I, what I see uh, as important is, you know, the global effort has to be closely linked to the local effort in terms of perspective. How do we see the problem? How we are going to address this problem in the long term? And, um, and secondly, operational-wise, again, the local efforts as well as the international effort should be there because operationally the challenges are there. No country, as I said earlier, can address all operational challenge by itself. It needs support from the international community. Though there should be at the operational level at the same time. And then finally, at the implementation stage also the same applies. The local effort as well as the international effort. I think, uh, again, I would like to thank the IDMC for their support in terms of giving us uh, these important uh, data. But there is one thing. Uh, they will be more strong um, as a center when governments are strong because they are the ones, if they want to get really objective assessment of the IDPs, they should be able to get objective facts and evidence that come mainly, basically, from governments. Otherwise, uh, it, will be, it will be very difficult. So we are now working together, uh, supporting each other. That's why I would like to say, and thank you very much. What line, what uh, a national strategy for uh, responding in a comprehensive way to internal displacement should uh, should look like, and I like the those three principles that you're using as your um, your guiding uh, philosophy uh, to develop that ownership, leadership, and partnership. Um, I think that uh, that is going to be the biggest. Um, uh, the, the, the most important objectives in many countries and, uh, and also probably where there will be uh, the largest number of obstacles. And I think that we can, I hope that we can in the discussion start talking about what it actually takes to get that ownership, to get proper leadership around the, the, this issue. And I think Ethiopia is, uh, is showing a very positive example there. You've talked about the need for a uh, an institutional, for institutional clarity uh, and strong systems for, for, for putting in place this response, uh, for this response to be both on the prevention side but also on the longer term development side. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned the other day that in, uh, Ethiopia is also developing a multi-year development plan within which internal displacement will be fully incorporated, which I, I also think represents um, a, a good way forward. Um, before we get to, to that, I would like to hand over to Ambassador Saleh um, 
for a different perspective, uh, I'm sure, but a very interesting one as well for, to give us an exam some examples from uh, your experience in Iraq. Thank you. I think it's really we need to know and outline the main issues, even being touched by some of the speakers here. Uh, one, what, co what, what caused really the IDPs to appear in, in a country? And I think it, it varies from one country to another. I know Ms. Belka Bilak touched on that and said probably mostly is the conflict in the country. And um, the majority of, of the highest percentage of that for Iraq was really coming from Daesh, where it's the security issue, which about started in mid of 2014 and it's about 40% of the land was occupied by Daesh. And that really came from, not the only one, but the main one is from the border with Syria, which we have about between six to 700 kilometers. Um, and it's very insecure border then uh, because of the situation where it was very fluid in, in Syria. And also in Iraq, we just started the new democratic Iraq in 2003. So when um, Daesh got into Iraq, and that's what, what, what happened, the IDPs. And, and I think uh, according to the data from IDMC, and I think some other resources says, it's about um, six million IDPs were happening in Iraq, which is the fourth largest um, case happening in the world. And, and I think the, the percentage and the number of IGPs around the world is really uh, very high, but Iraq really gets a big chunk of that, which is six million. In, in, in those four years, at least, since Daesh got into the country, um, we managed to return about 70%. This is a very high number. We work so hard to make sure that happens because the faster, the sooner you return IDPs to their places, the calmer the, the country will be. Because if, if one of the, the issues could be creating problems into the country, if you don't settle, have the IDPs in the country could create into internal instability, and that's what creating problems could be going into ethnic groups, could be uh, going to um, sectarian, and in order to avoid that, especially in Iraq, a country where it has um, different ethnic groups, different religions, different uh, uh, people, where their heritage, their culture is different. We have the Sumerian uh, in the south and the Assyrian in the north, and Kurds, Arabs, Muslims, Christians. So we needed to tackle that issue quickly, and we did managed to a certain degree to make, uh, to have a control of, over that situation. Of course, this um, didn't happen without the help of the world. And uh, from here, we, uh, we express our, our uh, appreciation to the um, International Coalition, obviously, and also UNAMI, which is the main umbrella for the United Nations in Iraq, which they've been there for quite a few years and they are very welcomed uh, in, in, in Iraq and in working with them, international organizations, UNHCHR, OCHA, civil society, IOM, and obviously I wouldn't forget, there are unknown soldiers really that most of us we don't know also contributed to that situation to help and uh, get things uh, calmer. Also, and just recently we had uh, the, the election, parliamentary election, and we needed to settle that quickly as soon as possible, otherwise we'll create problems, even though the issue has not been solved yet, even though we finished with the election on uh, May 12. There are some issues about the results because of the IDPs, um, but we managed to get these people back to their towns um, so they can cast their vote, or even if they are in another town we allow them to vote for their town because in Iraq you vote for your own province. Wherever you are, you vote there. So for those IDPs, we managed to give them that uh, choice to, to vote for their uh, town. Um, IDPs, 
are usually is, is, is a burden on any progress of the country, uh, financial system, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the stability of, of the country. Uh, and I think this is the role as we, we adopt this philosophy in Iraq that you think, uh, uh, you think globally and act uh, locally by asking the world, they need to do their, especially the influential countries, they need to do their, their share and, and also giving a helping hand to those countries who are in need uh, for that help in order to bring it, uh, the stability of that country. So if we don't act, think globally as things could escalate, which was really what happened in Daesh, Iraq was really the main front of fighting Daesh and then Syria. Otherwise, this was not really being taken care of in Iraq, would have uh, spread around the world. And so keeping the case, and that's why the international com community realized that issue and then came to, <coughs> to help Iraq, and, and I think also they are in, in, in Syria doing the same thing. Um, um, a couple of the speakers really touch on the IGPs. If we don't take care of that, that's the other thing. They become refugees and then come up, become uh, the world's problem. And we are seeing it in Iraq. Uh, there are a couple of millions also left the country because we are not addressed the issue quickly enough because of the resources, financial support, and then they needed to, I guess, to go to the other countries. and. Uh, but with that, Iraq respect the freedom and the choice of the Iraqi people, whether, whether they want to come back to, the, to Iraq or not. Some of them were settled, and some of the countries were working with Iraq, and like they want to bring them back. But Iraq really f believe, firmly believe that uh, it's the choice of the people. If they want to come back, we respect that. If they want to come back, we take them. So we cannot force them to, to come back to the, to the country. Um, of course, we don't forget the IDMC's role and uh, important uh, case that they're carrying and exposing this issue because uh, reporting this, annual meetings, tell the world what's going on around the world, and it's, it's the voice of those people are affected, and that's how we, the world, collectively come into helping these countries who are need, in need to settle and solve the IGP um, issues. Um, the, the, out of the six uh, million there were um, IGPs in Iraq, 18% uh, of those were women. This was really a big chunk. Uh, and considering the countries, usually Iraq have big families, a family of consists of five or six, and uh, this really was uh, an issue for Iraq to make sure women are really taken care of. And, and um, obviously, uh, those 70% that we returned, obviously was a big percentage of them, uh, women and their kids. Um, the, the things that we, we've done in the country when we faced with this issue, uh, in order to return, because of Daesh was involved in occupying these houses and towns and uh, uh, schools, we need to make sure that all these places are uh, cleared from the boob traps because a few cases happened, people rushed, they want to go back to their homes, which we understand, and things were exploded on them because Daesh wired almost. Uh, 99% of all the buildings, the houses, the schools with booby traps. As soon as you walk in, and like the the Holy Quran for the, the Muslims, as soon as they see it on the ground, you want to pick it up and kiss it, and then here we go, there is a booby trap underneath, and that's where they explode and uh, kill the people. So we worked so hard, there was some delay, but we worked hard with the army uh, to make sure they clear the houses and the public buildings before they turn these people safely back to their homes. And also the same thing uh, applies to um, opening schools and hospitals and, and getting these ready for people to, to use. Um, and of course the, the main, uh, the electrical grid, uh, the, uh, the water filtration system has to be in a place before these people go back. And we managed to a certain degree to a manageable level for people to be there until we rebuilt uh, all these uh, 
uh, towns and, and areas were destroyed. And above all, maintaining, not just the moment they go it's safe and secure, but to maintain that security all, all along until people, they feel really safe and they don't need to go back, out again out of uh, their uh, towns. The, the, the main challenges, I would like to mention a couple. Um, rebuilding um, completely destroyed towns and, and cities. And there was uh, an investment conference in Kuwait in February dedicated only for these, only for these, mostly only for these areas were destroyed uh, and affected by the fighting, uh, fighting Daesh. Also, which is really very important, is providing uh, psychological consultations, especially for women and kids. That's a challenge. We, Iraq is, has a short of that, and a couple of countries is lending a hand in, in giving us this, but still comparing with the number of people, uh, as I said, about six million, and the number of consultation is really a very small percentage, so we need more of that, and that's we have to, to fix it. And obviously, not in one country in the world to have such a, an issue and a problem and disaster of fighting terrorism and destroying 40% at least of the country because of fighting Daesh, financially capable address that. And that's why we had a couple of conferences around the world uh, to give a, a lending hand uh, to Iraq, uh, which really um, OCHA uh, committed by getting donors for about uh, 568 millions that was according in, in April 2018, but we really we didn't collect uh, up about 6% of that. It's about 17 million, and we have a long way to go. This issue needs to be solved. Iraq, hopefully the oil process will get improved. We have money, we have resources, we have oil, but as soon as the things get better financial and technology, we can address. But meanwhile, probably the helping hand comes from the world and uh, to settle and resolve this uh, issue. Um, again, uh, we appreciate this venue, and we needed this venue, and I think it's very important. As uh, Mr. Uh, Walter was mentioning in his uh, talk that really we did not give enough time to this issue, this case around the world. And I, and I hope really this is a good start and a good voice to give this issue uh, publicity and address it officially, Human Rights Council or New York uh, General Assembly to address this issue. Thanks again, and we appreciate it. Thanks. What it takes uh, for a country to deal with um, ongoing flows of uh, displacement year in, year out, whilst a country is at the same time attempting, attempting to rebuild, reconstruct after years of war and dealing with already very important caseloads of, of IDPs. Um, and I think the, 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 that illustrates very well why it's so important to, to, to merge approaches that, um, that can respond to the immediate uh, needs of people, but that can also start building uh, the foundations for longer-term security and, and stability. Um, you mentioned, um, you mentioned a number of uh, important points. Again, Iraq is also facing the same challenges as uh, Afghanistan um, when it comes to returns, um, and that is de definitely something that uh, needs to be uh, addressed much more, that we can focus on much more in the, in the discussion. You, you mentioned the, um, the economic impact that um, IDPs uh, have represented for, for the country, for local economies. It would be um, really interesting to understand a little bit more about that, how that actually plays out uh, in Iraq. Uh, but also in other contexts, we'll be opening the, this question to the floor later. Um, and then you, you've brought in a, um, an important aspect, and that's the gender aspect, you know, the, how women um, can in some cases be affected in very specific ways and uh, require very specific types of responses. And I think that's a good segue to uh, Ambassador Khan, who I'm sure will be bringing that perspective through in her presentation of displacement in Fiji, but also in the wider Pacific region. So, Ambassador Khan, over to you for the launch of this valuable report. Um, the global report does tell us um, that the 10 countries with the highest uh, displacement risk relative to population size are in fact small island developing states. 
And we also know this significant increase in numbers of new displacements in uh, 2017 um, arising from sudden onset disasters. And of course, Fiji is a classic country um, in, the, in the Pacific where the frequency and the intensity of hurricanes, cyclones, and storms uh, have really forced us to realize that we have to move away from crisis mode when, when responding to disasters into governance mode because we know that cyclones and hurricanes are going to happen, they're going to happen every year, that our people are going to be affected by floods, and so therefore we have to have a system which really lasts beyond the crisis uh, system. And this is where, of course, the value of the Sendai framework came in. And we were able to integrate the Sendai framework into our internal systems, our policies, and our laws to ensure that um, in responding to sudden onset disasters, we did, in fact, have a participatory model. Um, it was a model that recognized that disasters create vulnerability, but they also exacerbate existing uh, areas of vulnerability, such as gender and disability. And uh, really factoring that in to, into our governance structure and responding to crises um, has become a very valuable and a very important part of Fiji's work in the past few years. But in addition to that, we have, of course, um, experienced a new kind of displacement, and that is displacement which is planned which is planned as a result of a knowledge that we have in Fiji that our communi communities are going to be have, to have to shift from the coastal areas to higher ground because of rising sea levels. And of course, this is a common problem in the Pacific. We're lucky that we have higher ground. There are some countries in the Pacific which are flat coral atolls where the people are not able to shift to higher ground at all. So in relation to figures, it is anticipated that 63 villages and settlements will have to move from where they are to higher ground. And in confronting this reality, Fiji really had to ask itself about how we were going to weave a more participatory, a more democratic model into this model of shifting people. And therefore, we had to start planning our relocation guidelines. And in planning our relocation guidelines, the 20-year-old guiding principles were extremely valuable. They were valuable because they showed us to put, that it was necessary to put people first in the center of any relocation plans. Secondly, that it was very important to build relocation plans and plans for um, housing people even after sudden onset disasters in a way which recognized the dignity and the humanity of the individual. We really needed to move away from talking about statistics and talking about people. And then we realized that in relocating people and drafting our relocation guidelines based on humanity and dignity and on the guiding principles, we realized also that we had to change the way that we'd been doing things in talking to people and the communities for the last 100 years. Fiji is based on a community which is very traditional, which is very conservative, and in most areas very patriarchal. And if you are shifting a traditional community from its land and indigenously owned land, where clearly the people will not want to move because this is the land of their ancestors, then the question of participation and consultation arises. With whom are we consulting? Are we going to consult with the people who are the traditional leaders of that land and of that community? Or are we going to change our consultation model? And are we suddenly going to ask where the women are in the village? Which was a novel question, I can assure you, in many villages. And of course, now we have accepted the fact that we have to change the model of participation. And the relocation guidelines for Fiji, which are still in draft and still going through consultation processes, have accepted that no one gets relocated without their permission and without their request. And it is based on the concept of the community asking the government for assistance to move. It is not government shifting communities willy-nilly around Fiji. The second really important thing about changing this democratic model of relocation is that you're moving schools as well. And when you're moving schools, you're going to have to ask the children where they would like their school to be. That also is a novel proposition in Fiji, uh, where children are considered to be very good children if they're neither seen nor heard. 
So, therefore, in a school that was recently relocated in Fiji, the Wadi Wadi District School in the Lao group, Fiji had to confront the fact that suddenly children became very important in this relocation, and they had to be asked where they wanted their school to be. And, of course, the mothers uh, who, um, who were going to take the children to school and who were responsible largely for uh, gathering water uh, as well. So creating task forces in the community on relocation became an important new procedure for Fiji. And uh, Fiji is one of the very few countries in the Pacific, I believe the first country in the Pacific, to decide on having relocation guidelines at all and in, to ensure that it is, in fact, adopted with this thread of people at the center, to ensure that it recognizes the importance of gender in the relocation process, both in the participatory process when having the uh, decision to relocate, but also once you relocate, the steps taken for relocation, where asking women and involving women become so important. And lastly, very, very importantly, if we are going to have relocation guidelines, then we have to take into account traditional rights. You're moving a fishing people to a digging people. And you're moving people from the land of their ancestors where they have spiritual links and a great identity which is linked to the land of their ancestors. And you're moving it to a strange land where the ways are strange for them. And this kind of relocation has the potential of doing great destruction to a nation if it is not done with sensitivity and understanding and respect for indigenous rights. So having this people-centered relocation process, ensuring that we have a governance process which respects this, and ensuring that any guidelines and governance processes integrates the guiding principles becomes an important priority for Fiji. And we continue to work on that, uh, not only uh, in, in Fiji, but in the Pacific. I do want to say also how much uh, what has been already said in this panel uh, about the lack of information, about the lack of data, the importance of having it, the importance of having disaggregated data in relation to relocation. I want to say how important that is also for a small island developing state where disaggregation is a difficult journey. Um, secondly, I wanted to also say that we no longer see that there is a great difference between planning for relocation in response, in response to disasters and climate change as being any different from response to development. For us, the development of our nation must be based on this knowledge that every year we're going to have a number of hurricanes and cyclones. It must be based on this knowledge that our sea levels are rising and our villages are disappearing, and we need to shift them. And so for us, as my colleague and friend from Ethiopia said, for us, this marriage between development and relocation is one which is so important, and uh, without which really Fiji cannot, cannot plan. And so therefore, preventing the displacement is sometimes impossible if we're talking about slow onset disaster, but at least we can plan in advance, we can understand what we're doing, and we can have a governance process which is built in um, to our development processes, which reflects this people-centered approach which takes into account the importance of the empowerment of women, of children, of persons with uh, disabilities, and persons from indigenous communities. Thank you.